This summer, though, we talked about this last week. I won't spend too much time in it, but this summer, we, we, uh, last week, we talked about being a church that leans in to what he's doing this summer, uh, and that's collectively as a body that we're not going to forsake gathering with one another. We're not gonna we're not gonna quit just because summer is busy. Amen. And it's busy. There's there's a lot going on. It's Fourth of July weekend. I was here a little bit later last night, just praying through some stuff, and there was fireworks, and this whole building was like shaking. I'm like, where is this? <laughs> it's it's going to be a busy week, and it's going to be a busy summer, and I'm a person too. Tori and I, like, we're getting pulled and challenged with a lot of distractions and a lot of different directions to the point that, it, like, we wanted to have a date night this past week, and it was like, our, our schedule is just so insane right now that it's to have a date night with just each other, it's, we either have to cancel something say no to something or like push something off and it's worth it but it's just like I get it it's busy it's a busy summer Um, but the challenge is is with that busyness there's a temptation to check out of things of Jesus as well and we're not just talking about not coming to church on Sunday we're talking about seeking after Jesus to the point where our summer is fixated on him is he's he's the direction that we want to go this summer and and we wait with expectation that we will meet with God this summer that it might be busy for us but he still wants to move in power he still wants to do something just because your schedule is busy he's still here he's leaning in and so our challenge is to also lean in amen Let's do it. Speaking of a busy schedule, Tori and I recently had a wedding to go to. We, we go to a lot of weddings because we're just at that age, I think, where everybody's getting married, which is awesome. Have you guys ever seen, I, I feel like it's a new trend, but maybe I'm just out of the loop, but have you seen the wedding dance where they do at the receptions? It's like the... Um, I don't know what they call it, the, like the married couples dance where they invite all the married couples out on the floor and the DJ, they just play one song, but the DJ will go through, they'll start at like the newlyweds and he'll go through years of being married. And if he says a number that's higher than the amount of years in which you've been married, then you have to exit the dance floor. Have you, has anybody seen that? Yeah, okay, cool. So, you know, Tori and I, we, we love that. I think it's an amazing thing. And so, well, it never fails, right? Because so we'll go out there and we're like, all right, you know, let's dance. And so it's funny because the DJ usually, if it's a good DJ, they'll be like, all right, less than a year. And so that gets the, the bride and the groom out immediately. And it's funny. And then Tori and I, to all of our young friends, are like, suckers, you know, you've been married for like a year or whatever. And then it never fails. Like 10 seconds later, he's like, all right, in five years. And Tori and I are like, Okay, you know, that was, that was the best 10 seconds ever, whatever. But it never failed, and I love it because at the end of the song, there's, us, there's usually just, he, the, the, the announcer, or the DJ get, gets down to one couple in, in the whole room that's been married the longest. And so it'll be, I don't know, 50 or 60 years, and you'll catch me, if you're at a wedding with me, you'll catch me in the corner, like, crying. Because it's just, I love this picture of these, this couple that not only have they been married for 50 or 60 or however, 100 years, I don't know, but not only that, but they're still wanting to dance together. <laughs> and I'm like, I just, I, it, it gets me every time. Because I, I love long-lasting marriages. And it also never fails that, that that couple, the older couple usually in the middle of the dance floor, they're like not even really dancing. They're kind of just holding each other up because like they don't even have kneecaps anymore. They're just totally, they're just, they're kind of just like swaying, but they're smiling and they're not even talking because they're comfortable enough to just be in the presence of each other. Maybe they're tired of hearing each other talk. I don't know. But that's probably not the case. Look, if you have been married that long and you're still willing to dance and love on your wife or your husband, praise God for that. I, I love that. So we've been at so many weddings, it seems like, the past year. And I, that's like probably my favorite thing they do at receptions. And I'll get down and dance, trust me. But I love... 
I love that one, because that's Tori and I's goal, is just to be that old couple. Tori will still have her knees, but mine will be long gone by then. She'll be holding me up, and we just did it. We, we're excited for that. And I just, in the conversation about friends of God, I just am reminded of the language that the Bible uses for us, for Je- it says Jesus and his bride. Jesus is coming back for his, for his bride. And so it uses this language of Jesus as the bridegroom, as the, as the groom. And he says he's coming back for his bride, for his church, he, for you. For you are the bride of Christ. And if <laughs> it blows my mind because in a in hundred lifetimes, I would never come up with that language. Because if I wouldn't have read it straight in here, I would, have, I would think that you're speaking heresy because it's like, this is God we're talking about. Like, this is not like this cute marriage. Like, this is God. But that's the language that it uses. And it's, it's just, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around this idea that God wants to be in a marriage-like relationship because marriage is the most intimate and faithful relationship you'll have on earth. And God says like, I, Jesus and his bride, I want that with you. I, I want to fully give myself to you as a husband does for his wife and vice versa. And I, I, want, I want all of you in return. And I, it's, it's this love, intimate relationship. And that's what I want for you. And it, I can't get over it. And back to the, the, that wedding dance is, it is so obvious, those people who want to dance when they're 60 years into marriage, it's so obvious that at that point, I mean, they've been through the ups and the downs and the, they've seen it all. But they are best friends. They're, they're best friends. And I feel like you should be best friends with the one who you marry. The one who you love the most, you should be friend, best friends with them. And that's not to say you shouldn't have other friends. Have other friends. I have other friends other than my wife. Praise God. Like, that is, so, that is so vital. We should have other friends. But you should be best friends with the one that you marry. And, and Jesus says that. He says, I, I call you my bride, and I call you my friend. John chapter 15. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's doing or his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. Okay, we're gonna look at that, we're gonna look at that last part again this morning. No longer do I call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. He doesn't know what he's doing. But instead, I've called you friend. For everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. And that word learned, you can also use the word heard, and and that's an interchangeable translation. So everything that I have learned, everything that I've heard my father say to me, Jesus says, I now make known to you. And so we see this relationship, this thing throughout Scripture where hearing God, hearing His voice is related and correlated to friendship. And friendship is related to being entrusted with the voice of God. And we know that to be true with our earthly friendships, right? Show me a friendship where there's no trust and I'll show you a dysfunctional relationship, right? Like, f- trust is the foundation of friendship. It's the, trust is the front door in and breaking trust is the back door out. It, tr- you can't be friends with somebody if they don't trust you with what they really want to say with their voice. It's like, these are, this is really what's on my heart and I trust you, I want to tell you this. That's, that's what it takes for friendship. And so there's a powerful place we see friendship and God's voice being connected in the Old Testament, and it's with this guy named Moses. Anybody ever heard of Moses? Raise your hand if you've heard of Moses. Nobody, right? (laughs) Moses plays this huge role in the Bible, huge role. I spent the last week like going through 
stories, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and I told Tori, I was like, I should just read the entire book of Exodus, close it, say amen, and just leave. It's, it's just, we should just read it. But there's so, because there's so many amazing connections with Moses in the entire narrative of the whole Bible and how it connects all to Jesus. And there's so many things, but one thing that I think we often overlook when we see the grand scheme and all these connections and stuff is that, is that Moses was a true friend of God. So this morning, that's what we're looking at. Moses, friendship with God, that's the goal. And we hit this last week, so I won't go too much into it. If you missed last week, check it out. It's on the YouTube channel. Uh, but just a, a reminder, because it's important, is salvation is a free gift. But friendship is not. Salvation, it says salvation is by grace through faith. There's nothing you can do. But remember, James says, a faith without works is dead. The Dylan translation is faith without works is like coffee without caffeine. What's the point? It's just bean water and it still feels you leaving, it still leaves you feeling dead inside. If when you drink it, it's nasty and there's no benefit. Faith without works is like coffee without caffeine. Take it or leave it. Sorry, decaf drinkers. <laughs> Salvation, <laughs> stupid, I know. Salvation is free, friendship is not. Because friendship requires something of you. Friendship requires trust at a minimum, but at a, likely friendship is much more costly. And so as we learn to walk with the Lord, we learn to understand that it will cost you something, I promise it will. It just does. But we also learn as the closer and the deeper we get in intimacy with the Father, that whatever it costs, it, it has no comparison to the beauty of his touch. Amen? Open your Bible with me to Exodus chapter 33. It's going to be one of our, we're going to do a lot of Bible, if you don't mind. We're going to open the Word of God this morning. Exodus chapter 33, we're going to, we're going to hit there. Um, so have that ready to go. But I'm going to read several other scriptures and just have you listen. But just some, a little bit of context so uh, you have a refresher is up until this point, Moses has become the, he's, he's like the central figure of this story. And so does anybody remember Moses' first supernatural radical encounter with God? What was the first time he encountered like in a big way, God? The burning bush, I heard somebody say it. The burning bush, God speaks to Moses through a burning bush, which let's just not, let's just be honest. That's crazy. Okay. That's crazy. It's on the Mount, on Mount Horeb. Uh, God gives Moses through the burning bush, a special assignment. He says, I, like, I need you to stop what you're doing, put a pause on everything, put a pause on your life. And I need you. There's Israelites that are in, enslaved in Egypt. And I need you to go there and rescue them all. No big deal. And Moses if you remember, was very reluctant because this, first of all, this is a big job. This is like, oh, just stop everything you're doing and go rescue all the slaves there. That's a big job. And also he dealt with a lot of feelings of inadequacy. He felt very, very inadequate. Nevertheless, Moses obeys the commands and the ask of God to return to Egypt. And then, so he confronts Pharaoh. Do you remember that story? So Moses then, through Moses, God unleashes this series of plagues. It's like this ultimate showdown between God, Moses, and Pharaoh. It's like, it's insane. And finally, Pharaoh releases the Israelites. And so then they're set free. They start going through the wilderness. And Moses, this entire time, is acting as this mediator between the Israelites and with God. So you remember the Red Sea, he parts the Red Sea, they run, and then it closes back in on all the enemies. And then anytime God wants to speak, he speaks to Moses and then Moses to the Israelites. And it's interesting because we, part of the story that's it's important to know is the Israelites, although God literally rescued them from slavery, they were found to frequently lose their faith, weren't they? Moses would go up the mountain, and sometimes it took a couple days. It wasn't just like 10 minutes and he's done. And they would get bored. They, they would lose their faith. They would check out. And 
they would, it says they like took off their earrings and their jewelry, they melted it down and started just worshiping this idol, which is just like so strange in our context, but they just lost their faith several times, the Israelites, but Moses remained faithful. And that's the important thing to remember is he remained faithful to his call. He wasn't perfect, but he, he remained faithful to God. He remained obedient. And so we often see Moses like pleading to God on their behalf because they had lost their faith. Keep Exodus 33 open, but I, I want to read Exodus 19 just so we can get the full picture uh, of what's happening here. Sit back, relax, and, and try to picture this in your mind. Exodus 19 says, Exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking at camp at Rephidim, at Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. It says, then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called to him from the mountain and said, give these instructions to the family of Jacob and announce it to all the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on earth for all the earth belongs to me. And you will be my kingdom of priests. You'll be my holy nation. This is the message that you have to give the people of Israel. So Moses returned from the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything that the Lord had said. And all the people responded together. We will do everything that the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, I'm gonna come to you in a thick cloud, Moses so that the people themselves can hear me when I speak to you. That way they will always trust you. So Moses then told the Lord what the people had said, and the Lord said, Go down then and prepare my people for my arrival. Consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash all their clothes. Be sure that they're ready, because on the third day, for on that day I will come down on Mount Sinai and all the people will watch. It says, mark off a boundary all around the mountain and warn the people, be careful, don't go up the mountain, don't even touch its boundaries. Anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. No hand may, uh, no hand may touch the person or animal that does cross the boundary. Instead, stone them or shoot them with arrows. They must be put to death. However, when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, then the people can go up the mountain. Okay, <laughs> it's a lot. So God says to Moses, he's speaking to Moses, and he says, I'm gonna appear in a thick cloud on Mount Sinai. And this is, and this is so, because you rescued them out of, Egypt, out of Egypt, and you've been telling them that you hear from God and that you're leading them, and they've kind of trusted you, but I wanna, I wanna prove it to them so that they'll always trust you. And so next time you come up here, I'm gonna come down in a thick cloud, and, and when I speak to you, it's gonna sound like thunder, and everybody's gonna hear it. So that they know, so that they know I'm speaking to you, Moses. And he says, this is going to be so powerful that you've got to mark off boundaries around the mountain. And if anybody even touches the boundary, you got to kill them. And don't even touch them when you kill them. Just pick up a rock or an arrow and just shoot it at them. Okay, let's be honest. <laughs> That sounds pretty harsh, does it not? Yes, it's okay to say yes, because it's hard to wrap our mind around the idea that God would have any boundaries. And more so, we, we all have grown up in a generation where, where hearing from God has been a common thing. But God is showing here that this is no ordinary experience. It's like, you're talking about meeting in my presence. This is, this is a holy moment, and holy is the opposite of common. This is a distinct moment that I'm going to show everybody that I talk to you. So in verse 16, it says, So on the morning of the third day, thunder roared, 
lightning flashed and a dense cloud came down on the mountain and there was a long blast from the ram's horn and all the people trembled. Moses led them from the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain and all of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. The smoke billowed in the sky like smoke from a brick kiln and the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke to God and God thundered his reply. That is wild. So go to chapter 33 with me. We're gonna start in verse seven. So this is another way that Moses would enter the presence of God other than Mount Sinai. It says, now Moses, Moses used to take a tent and, and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the, the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And, and whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance of their own tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. It says, as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Now, now catch this. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they all stood and worshiped at the entrance of their own tent. And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Very next chapter, Moses is up on the mountain again and it says, Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets, the covenant of the law in his hands and he wasn't even aware, but his face, it says his face was radiant because he had spoken with God. It says when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was shining and they were terrified to come near him. I... I want us to see this and picture this because this is the way that it used to be. You have this, this scene in Exodus 19 where all the people are going, okay, we're, we're about to see Moses, this, this guy. He's a cool guy, but we're about to see a, a human go up the mountain into the very presence of Almighty God. And, and every time Moses spoke and God would speak back and Moses would speak and, and the Lord would reply, all the people heard was just thunder. I mean, it was insane. They're like, Moses is talking to God. This is not something that a human is supposed to be able to do. He's in the presence of, of God, the one who rescued us. And then it became this common practice where Moses would have this tent. They called the tent of meeting. And everybody knew, hey, when Moses goes in there, we got to like get out, get, wake up. You got to stand outside your own tent. You got to just stand back and watch because something's about to, something crazy is about to happen. And the clouds comes and falls at the, at the front of the tent. And Moses talks to God. It says he, God speaks to him face to face as he would with a friend. And everybody's just standing there watching and in, in awe. This is the way that they viewed meeting with God and hearing the voice of God. And what's, what's crazy is, okay, you read all of Exodus 19, 33, all of these things, and it's this insane reverence and like, oh, if you poke the mountain, you'll die. And then nowadays, meeting with God has become so ordinary casual, or even burdensome. It's like, it's been a long day, brushing my teeth, you know, got to get ready for bed, but I, I feel guilty. I should probably hang out with God. So maybe just for five minutes, I'll, I should probably pray or something. I don't know. Maybe I'll read the verse of the day. And it's just like, what, what, how, how did we get so far? Away? I know it's changed a little bit, but how did we get so far away? 
And, and we have pastors and ministry leaders like begging their entire life's work is just like, please, please, please spend a moment with God. Like just 10 or 15 minutes a day that it's all it takes to read the whole Bible in a year. Just please, please just spend time with him. As, as if it's just like this burden that we just have to plead and beg people to do. Just take 10, 15 minutes in the morning and, and then you can go on with the rest of whatever you're gonna do. You can, you can do the more important things. It says, God would speak to Moses face to face just as one speaks to a friend. And we've got to remember that this idea of being a friend of God is much more than an acute saying. It carries way more power than that. It says, even though all those Israelites are, they're, They've, they've proven unfaithful time and time again. I'm still, I'm still with you, Moses. You, you're faithful. You're obedient. My presence is going to go with you. I'm going to speak to you like a friend. So God goes with his faithful friend, Moses. He continues to lead the people. They pack up camp. They're headed towards the promised land. But along the way, the Israelites start complaining Part of me is like, man, God, why'd you choose such a whiny group of people? And then God's like, look at yourself, dude. <laughs> but they're complaining about all their hardships. God is like literally raining down food from the sky. And they're like complaining about the variety and the taste of it. But the, and this is after they melted down their jewelry. Again, we talked about it and, and started worshiping idols just because it took Moses too long to get off the mountain once. And Moses remains faithful. But he's like, God, I can't take it anymore. Like, I, I'm your friend. I love how you speak to me. I, I'm going to keep leading, but I need help. These people are whiners. They're complainers. I love them, but oh my gosh, I need help. So, so he asked the Lord for help, and the Lord says, okay, I'm going to have you appoint 70 leaders to come and help you. It says uh, God took the spirit, the same spirit that was on Moses, and, and placed it on all the 70 leaders. And so that worked out because there was a plurality of leadership, and it took some weight off of, off of Moses. It, it worked for a while. But then the friends started challenging Moses' leadership. Because they, they were like, oh, well, I've gotten the Spirit of God. Now I can prophesy and do all these things. Numbers chapter 12, just, you can just listen to it. Uh, Numbers chapter 12, it says, Miriam and Aaron, those are two of those 70 leaders. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a, married a Cushite. And they said, they asked, has the Lord only spoken through Moses? Because now hasn't he spoken through all of us? And it says, the Lord heard this. They weren't talking to the Lord. The Lord listens. I think we've gotten away from that teaching that, that the Lord has ears and hears what you're saying. Even when it's nasty. It says, <laughs> this is hilarious. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. Okay, Moses wrote that, which is just funny. I just, I was the most humble man on earth, believe it or not. I just, he was, but it's just, it's just funny. And he, if, I don't know. If Caleb came out and said that, by the way, I'm the most humble out of all of you. It's like, what did you just say? You know, <laughs> Moses was the most humble man on earth. At once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, he's saying to all three of them, he said, hey, come out to the tent of meeting, all three of you. Uh-oh. So the three of them went out, and it says, The Lord came down in a pillar of cloud again, and he stood at the entrance of the tent, and he summoned, he called for Aaron and Miriam. He's like, you two, come over here. So when, when they, the two of them stepped forward, he said, Listen to my words. <clears throat> when, when there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions, and I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face, clearly and, and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you afraid? Were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And it says the anger of the Lord burned against them and he left them. Absolutely wild, right? 
you have some of these leaders and they're like, Moses, you're not the only prophet anymore, man. Like we can hear from God too. What makes you so special? And God, and God steps in and he's like, hey, reality check. I speak to you in riddles and dreams and visions, but with my friend, it's face to face. I trust him with my voice. Remember when the Bible says that God gives grace to the humble and resists the proud? Moses has given his life up for his assignment. He's the most humble man on earth. He's been faithful. He's been obedient. Even when the rest of them weren't, he's not perfect, but he's humble. He says, my servant Moses, he's faithful in all my house. With him, I speak face to face. So one thing that we take away from the life of Moses is this. It's friends of God are obedient to his voice and commands as an expression of trust and intimacy. Friends of God are obedient to his voice and his commands as an expression of trust and intimacy. It's, it's that givenness relationship. It's the, it's the bride, I'll, I'll give my whole self to you and you'll give your whole self to me. You're obedient to my voice, my commands. And it's, it's not just this checklist. It's not this militant obedience, but it's just an expression of trust and intimacy. This is just what I have with you. So at this point, we look at the life of Moses and we can no longer even con try to convince ourselves that this relationship called, called a friend of God is just this fun, warm, cute saying, but it's, it's that this is a, a friendship with God who is above all and who calls you into his holy presence. He's the God who speaks. He's the God who listens. He's the God who desires intimacy and obedience. And the same powerful and intimate and beautiful friendship is found in John 15. Jesus calls his disciples friends. Jesus says, my disciples, the ones who obey my commands, I'm, I'm gonna invite you into this friendship. And this friendship, this friendship that I invite you into, it's marked by my voice. That's how you'll know. That's, that's how I separate my friend and the friends from servant. Like servants don't know his master's business, but I call you friends because I'm telling you the things that I've heard from the Lord. I'm telling you, it's marked by my voice. It's marked by knowledge and insight and revelation from God. I'm letting you in, my friend. Hebrews chapter three says, Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. This is New Testament. It's just calling back on the story of Moses. Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the, of the truths that God would reveal later. But Christ, as the son, he's in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house. It says, we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. So it says, Moses was faithful. Moses was obedient. And just like Moses, I call you friend. And all those truths that will be revealed later, I'm revealing now to you. A couple pages later, Hebrews chapter 10, it says, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and a life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And that curtain is a reference back to the tabernacle, if you're familiar, that, that separated the sinful with, with the presence of God. There had to be a separation, but Christ's work on the cross tore the curtain in half. Amen? And so he says, I'm giving you a new life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place, the holy of holy, that place on the mountain with the thunder and the lightning and the fire. You can go there. And since we have, since we have a great high priest, Jesus, who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Amen. 
It says, by the blood of Jesus, you can go right into the presence of God. By the blood of Jesus, that you can do the very things that my friend Moses was doing. I call you friend, enter my holy place. With sincere hearts, fully trusting him, fully trusting in him. That first truth again, friends of God are obedient to his voice and his commands as an expression of trust and intimacy. And I have two final ones for you. Friends of God receive his presence. And friends of God know his voice and they receive revelation. This marriage, this friendship, it cost Jesus way too much to be taken casually. Amen? It cost him everything. But he said, I'm inviting you. I'm calling you my bride. I'm giving myself over to you. The greatest sacrifice to give one's life for someone else. I'm doing that for you. And all I want is everything back. But as you give everything to me, I give everything to you. And it's just this love, intimate thing we have going on. You are no longer servant, but you're called friend. And I, I, I speak to you face to face like I did with my friend Moses in the most holy and high place because of the blood of Jesus. And it still blows my mind. It still blows my mind that people like, I hear somebody say, oh, I was driving in my car, just chatting it up with God, and, and, and I, like I heard him speak to me, and so I was talking to him back, and I'm like, hold on a second. You mean to tell me that you talked with God, <laughs> like almighty God with the fire and the thunder and the lightning that he did with Moses? Like you talked to that guy, he talked back to you, and you were driving 65 miles an hour down the highway, and you didn't wreck your car? I, I mean, it's just like, why do we take it so casually? And it is different, but we can't take it casually. It's common, thank the Lord, but it's not casual, amen? Oh my gosh, it's too much of a costly gift to take it casually and just sneak it in five minutes of our day at the end when we're exhausted. But this is the thing, this is the friendship that our hearts crave, desire, and, and finds fulfillment in, and, and, and nothing else can satisfy it's by the blood of Jesus that we get this privilege of being in constant friendship with him. Last one, Ephesians chapter three, it says, because of Christ and, your, and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. We have that ability now. And I never, I never wanna take that for granted. I think when we read heroes of the faith like Moses, that's why we started with Mary of Bethany last week. Because when we, when we read about heroes of the faith like Moses, we go, man, I, I wanna do stuff like that guy did. I, I, I wanna be, I wanna do big things for God. I, 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 want, I want you to use the spiritual giftings that you gave me, God. I will use my talents. I wanna do big things for you. And that is such a beautiful desire. We should desire that. But you're gonna go so much farther when your starting block is friendship than if you're trying to do it on your own. And that's the difference between a servant and a friend. It's because a friend is marked by his voice and, and intimacy. John 15, you're not a servant, you're a friend. Because servants are, are task-oriented. I'm going to close with this. Servants, servants are task-oriented. It's, it's, it's what, it's, I want the fruit. I want to see miracles. And they're great desires. But that's the end goal is seeing that happen. And so a servant tries to get favor by what they do. But a friend gets favor by the relationship. Amen? It's not meeting a quota. It's about knowing the voice of God, being able to go confidently into his presence, falling in love with him. Mike Bickle says it best. He says, he says there's two types of people in the world. There's lovers and there's workers. And lovers will always get more work done than workers. It's counterintuitive, but I think it's true. 
lovers will always get more work done than workers. Because I think there's this, there's this misunderstanding that if we're Mary of Bethany just sitting at the feet of Jesus, oh, we're just resting and like, we don't have to, you know, there's no work to be done. And there's work to be done. Amen. But when we start there at his feet, when we start there with friendship with God and we understand that we can speak to him face to face, I want to see those miracles that come out of that. Amen. Because we are thrown into a dimension, a, a, a further dimension and a, far, a bigger realm with God than we can ever imagine when we start with friendship with him. Not on our own accord, not as a servant does, not a task oriented. I'm going to gain favor by what I do. I'm going to gain favor because I'm your friend. Thank you, Jesus. He invites you into this. Come up the mountain, my friend. There will be a cost, there will, but it doesn't compare to the touch that, that you're going to receive. I call you friend, and I trust you with my voice. Amen? Would you stand and let's pray. Jesus, 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 we are so grateful. <clears throat> God, let us not take you, let us never take you casually. And there's, there's seasons where it feels like you're not speaking, and there's seasons where it seems a little bit more dry, but God, your mercies do re renew every single morning, that your joy goes further than we can ever imagine. Your joy is our strength, and it says is your peace that you give us goes beyond our understanding. And so, and so we see this, this relationship that we can have with you, and it's not dry at all. And so even if we're feeling that way, God, let it, let it not be true that we take you casually. God, because you are always working, and you are always moving, and you are always seeking this friendship with us. And you're coming back for your bride one day, but this is the relationship that we're called into now. God, we thank you for the blood of Jesus that made this possible. This fully givenness that Jesus gave to us in relationship and married us and became friends with us. God, I don't want to take that casually. But instead, I, I, I want to return all of it back to you. My time, my money, my energy, my everything, everything that you give to me for, like, I just, you can have it all. God, I, I, I want to lean in. I, I, I want to be your friend. It's more than a feeling. Uh, that stuff that Moses experienced, I, I want to see your presence that way. This holy and set apart time. God, forgive us when we feel like everything has to be just right to, to enter your presence. Forgive us when we don't prioritize seeking your face. Forgive us when we take the blood of Jesus casually. Thank you for loving us despite our unfaithfulness. Thank you for calling us friend. Draw us near to you this summer. I want to be known at the end of my life as a friend of God. God, would you bless us and anoint us with the power of your Holy Spirit to do all the good works and all of these things and doing big things just like Moses did and let it all start with the knowledge that we're your friend and there is power that comes from that. Thank you, Jesus. It is in your name that we pray and submit all these things to you. Amen.